chapter 5. We've been talking the past several weeks. Well, I'll just read this verse and then we'll, we'll go on from there. Ephesians 5, verse number 22. Um, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the, the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Wherefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife. They too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, that every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Let's bow our hearts down a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking at your word and studying it together this evening. As we do so, we pray that the things said and done would honor and glorify the name of Christ and edify the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, we've been talking the past several weeks about the remnant in Israel in and, and various different ways. We started off talking about the parable of the prodigal son and saw that how that parable of the prodigal son uh, is talking about the nation Israel and what's happening with that nation coming back to God. Um, we talked about the new birth and how the new birth uh, is that remnant in Israel receiving new life. We talked last week about the pearl of great price and how that remnant in Israel becomes li lively stones, those living pearls created through the fires of tribulation and the, and, uh, the, the persecution that Israel is going to suffer in the tribulation, the chastening. And tonight we want to look at that little flock from another perspective. We started with this passage in Ephesians 5, which of course is not about the little flock, but about the body of Christ. But in this passage, the body of Christ is um, the, the, the analogy that's used here of a Christ's relationship to his body is that of a husband and a wife. Um, if you notice there in verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the body, he's the savior of the church. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be their own husbands and everything. Um, he compares Christ and his church, as I said, to the husband and the wife. And we want to talk about that tonight, about the bride of Christ from this passage and some others like it in Paul's epistles, and we'll look at some more as we go on. Many people teach and have the idea that the church, the body of Christ, is the bride of Christ. That when Jesus Christ returns uh, in what's commonly called the rapture, he's coming to rapture away his bride. When he shall come, you know, used to sing a song, when he shall come to catch his waiting bride away. Um, and that bride is the church and we're caught up and then there's the marriage supper of the Lamb and all of that. Uh, and verses like this in Ephesians 5 you know, would seem to support that. But tonight we want to talk about the bride of Christ and exactly who it is. And, and as you might have already guessed, since we're talking about the remnant in Israel, that's what it's going to end up relating to. The bride of Christ will end up relating to and being that remnant in Israel, um, not the church, the body of Christ, but what we're going to look at some of those passages and just understand them also. Um, let's go back to the book of Isaiah to start with. Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah 54. Uh, in Scripture, both Israel and the body of Christ, uh, their relationship to God is compared to a husband and a wife. We saw the passage there in Ephesians 5. If you look back in Isaiah chapter 54 uh, and verse number 4. Isaiah 54, 4, Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath 
called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused saith thy God notice verse 5 there especially thy maker is thine husband the Lord of hosts is his name so that passage God says to Israel your maker is your husband and he's the Lord of hosts if you go to the book of Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 3 and we looked at this passage um in one of the studies in the past couple weeks, and that's really what um, prompted me to talk about this in, in this whole connection. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 14, uh, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take one of you, uh, I will take one of uh, you, I will, I'm going to say that again. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. So, verse 14, turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. So, again, the relationship there between Jehovah God and Israel is that of a, a, of a husband and a wife. He said, I'm married unto you. It's like a husband and a wife. And, and it is Jehovah. The passage we read back in Isaiah, you don't have to turn back there, but when he says, thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, that word Lord is in all capital letters. So, it's Jehovah. Jehovah is his name. Jehovah is your maker and is your husband. So in the Old Testament, uh, Jehovah God is presented as the husband of Israel, or Israel is the wife of Jehovah. When you get to Paul's epistles, and let's turn over to Romans 7, um, that analogy is used in Romans 7 also, uh, and, and other places, but we'll look at Romans 7 here uh, first. Romans 7 and verse 4. Romans chapter 7 verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised, who is raised from the dead, that we should, be, should bring forth fruit unto God. So Paul says there in Romans chapter 7, Ye are dead to the law uh, by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another. So, who are you going to be married to? Well, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So, who is it that we're married to? In that passage, he says, we're married to the one that's raised from the dead, to Christ. Um, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 2. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. And then, of course, there's the passage in Ephesians. We'll not go read that again. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may prevent, present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. So again, in in Paul's epistles there, it, it seems like he's saying to the church, the body of Christ, that I, I've espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin. It certainly sounds like our relationship to Christ is that like a husband and a wife. So you've got verses in the Old Testament, you've got verses in Paul's epistles that point to this relationship being like the relationship of a husband or wife. You're married to Jehovah in the Old Testament. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 here, I have espoused you unto one husband that I present you as a chaste virgin. So, is it Israel? Is it the body of Christ? Now, of course, traditional theology would say, well, the whole idea of separating Israel and the body of Christ is wrong. All of God's people are that bride, and whether it's Israel or whether it's the body of Christ, we are really just spiritual Israel. It's really just all one big group of people, and that's why both in the Old Testament and Paul's epistles, he talks about us being espoused to this one husband, talks about us being the, the wife of Jehovah, and so we really are, all God's people are married to him, as it were. All God's people become his bride at the return of Christ. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that when scripture, when you say something is like something, it doesn't necessarily mean it is that thing. If I say, you know, so and so has been like a father to me, well that doesn't mean he is my father, it means our relationship is like that of a father and a son. Or so and so is like a brother to me. 
Well, he, I don't have any physical, earthly, fleshly brothers, but so-and-so could be like a brother to me because um, we have a relationship that is like that. So in that sense, you know, just because the scripture says, you know, this relationship is likened unto a husband and a wife, or this relationship is likened unto a husband and a wife, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is that, that it is a husband and a wife, but the relationship is like that. For instance, the passage we read in, in Ephesians, and let's just flip back over there, Ephesians chapter 5, the idea there is that the relationship between Christ and the church is like unto that of a husband and a wife, in that the two shall be, verse 31, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. Well, the relationship of a husband and wife is forming one flesh, and that is like what happens with Christ in the church, because in verse um, 29, No man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We are members of his body. And as a husband and a wife become one flesh, so we have become one with Christ, members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And the Lord nourishes and cherishes his own body, just like a man nourishes and cherishes his own body, uh, so the Lord nourishes and cherishes the church. But that doesn't mean that we are his wife, simply that you see this relationship here between a husband and a wife, how the two become one, two different entities, become one flesh, and have a single identity. Well, the church and Christ, the church which is the body of Christ and Christ, become one and have one identity. Our, our identity becomes one in him, and his identity now becomes unified to us. His identity is now changed also because now he has a body of believers attached to him. So as a husband and a wife, two different entities become one flesh. So Christ and the church, two different entities become one. So to say it's like a husband and a wife doesn't necessarily mean it is a husband and a wife. And Paul gives a lot of indication that our relationship to Christ, our direct relationship, is not as his wife or as his bride, but rather as his body. Uh, if you turn back in Ephesians, here to Ephesians 2, uh, and look at verse 14, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, For he, that's Christ, is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them which were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, those verses, of course, talk about the formation of the body of Christ. Verse um, 15, to make himself of twain one new man. Verse 16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. So, Ephesians 2 is pretty clear that the the detail, the nuts and bolts of what's happening here is that we are being united to Christ. The Jew and Gentile are being united together with Christ as our head in one new man. In verse 16, it's called one body. Back in chapter 1, Verse 22, we talked about this Sunday morning, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to his church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. It's interesting in that passage that he doesn't say the church which is his wife, or the church which is his bride, but he says the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So when Paul identifies us specifically. You know, there are verses where he says, okay, it's like a husband and a wife, you've become one. He even says that you might be married to or joined to another, to that one that was raised from the dead. But when he identifies what we are specifically, he calls us the body of Christ. Now, it's always been hard for me to understand how you can be the body of Christ and be the bride of Christ. That seems to be a little 
just strange or something? I don't know. That you, if we are Christ and we are his body and, and his, our identity is all tied up with him and his with ours, then to say that we are also his bride seems to me to, to kind of contradict that or, or at least not, not mesh with that very well. Um, if you look over in Ephesians chapter 4, um, Paul talks about it also that, that title that we have uh, verse 11 and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ so again he doesn't say it's to edify the bride of Christ or to edify the wife of Christ but to edify the body of Christ so our identity is as his body, not as his bride, not as his wife. Uh, if you look to the book of Colossians, just over a couple pages here, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24, Colossians 1, 24, uh, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake. And what is that? Which is the church. So, what is his body? For his body's sake, what body? Which is the church. So again, when Paul names us, identifies us, he does it as the body of Christ. Uh, back in 1 Corinthians, and of course 1 Corinthians is one of Paul's earlier epistles. You know, some people would say, well... The, the early epistles of Paul are, are written to different people than the later epistles, and the church didn't start to Acts 28 and all of that. But verses like this are what would give me a hard time with that. In, in Ephesians, he clearly talks about the body of Christ, the church which is his body. In Colossians, the church which is his body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse number 27, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And in 1 Corinthians 12, he's giving you the, the detail about how that happens in verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So the body of Christ which is what we are, is formed by that baptism. It's in Ephesians chapter 2, it's the one new man that is formed. It's the one uh, new body that is formed. And it, it's, it's the identity that, that we're given. We're given that identity as the body of Christ. Not, and although Paul says at times, well, you know, this is, this is kind of like a husband and a wife, and, and I espouse you as a chaste virgin, uh, then, but what he calls us consistently from 1 Corinthians right on through the book of Ephesians and Colossians is we're, we're consistently called the body. And he gives the detail of how that body's formed. That one spirit baptizes us, whether we're Jews or Gentiles, whether we're bond or free, puts us into a body with Christ as the head and we as his body and forms a new creature, forms a new man, forms a one new body of Christ. So the detail that Paul gets into, although he does talk sometimes about our, our, our oneness and our unity is like that between a husband and a wife. As the two become one flesh, so we have become one with Christ. But then when he identifies, well, what is that thing that we've become? He says, well, it's the body of Christ is what you've become. When you became unified with him, you became his body. Now, what about Israel? Well, go back to Hosea chapter 2. And, and this passage we looked at also a couple weeks ago. And, and again, kind of you know, got my mind working in this direction toward talking about this idea of the bride of Christ. Um, we read about how thy maker uh, is thy husband. That, that Israel was the wife of Jehovah. And we saw back there in Jeremiah how he had written her a bill of divorce. Yeah, I'm going the wrong way, that's why I'm getting to Hosea. He had written her a bill of divorce, he had put her away. Um, in Hosea, we read a couple weeks ago about how Israel was an adulterous wife. If you look there in chapter 2 and verse 1 of Hosea, 
Well, let's just start down in, uh, well, okay, verse 1. Say unto your brethren, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhamah, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked, and set her as in the day that she was born, and make her as a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms, for their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread, my water, my wool, my flax, mine oil, and my drink. Um, in verse 2 we read plead with your mother plead for she is not my wife neither am I her husband now why is that well keep your hand there and go back to the book of Jeremiah that's because of what has happened with Israel um, verse um, uh, Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse uh, 6 Jeremiah 3 and verse 6 the Lord said also unto me, in the days of Josiah the king, hast thou seen what that, backsliding, or that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. So it's that adulterous wife. There she has played the harlot. And it's a spiritual sense here. She's committing spiritual adultery. She's gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree. And that's the, the idea of worshiping idols and offering offerings to other gods on, on, the, on the high places and under the green trees. And verse 7, And I said after she had done all these things, Turn thou unto me, but she, she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So why is it that God says in Hosea chapter 2, plead with your mother, mother plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Well, because I divorced that harlot. <laughs> That's why. Uh, that, that when she went and played the harlot with those other gods, I wrote her a bill of divorce. Based upon the law, then adultery was a, was a just cause for divorce. And so based upon the law, I wrote her a bill of divorce. We're operating on our old covenant ground. My wife, God says, remember in, in, in Isaiah he said, your maker is your husband. So that maker that was her husband, Jehovah God, the Lord of hosts is his name, when she went out and committed adultery, he wrote her a bill of divorce and said, I put you away. And Hosea writes and says, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Verse 5 of Hosea chapter 2, For their mother hath played the harlot, she that conceived them hath done shamefully. But now the whole point of Hosea chapter 2 is, I want to bring you back to your first love. Uh, Hosea chapter 2 and verse 16. Hosea 2, 16. And it shall be in that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Bali. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, the creeping things of the ground. I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and will make them to lie down safely, and I will betroth thee unto me forever." Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. Now, what does it mean when you're betrothed to someone? You're engaged, yeah. Yeah, and the, the, the old um, Anglican marriage service, which is the one you hear all the time, which is, um, you know, do you take so and so to be your lawful wedded wife and blah 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 um, nobody says it this way anymore but what you ask the bride and groom would repeat is and, and thereto I plight thee my troth that's what they're supposed to say but nobody understands what that means anymore so it means I pledge my faithfulness 
When you plight your troth, <laughs> it means you pledge your faithfulness. So that being betrothed to someone or to plight your troth is to pledge yourself to them. Not, you know, and the marriage ceremony at one point contained that terminology because it's old English terminology. I plight you my troth. I am betrothed to you. I am pledged to you. And now when we actually get married, I plight you my troth. I give you my troth. I don't know why I keep looking at Bernie, I guess because he's old. And I figure he understands it. So <laughs> I plight you my troth is to, to pledge that faithfulness in marriage. And here in Hosea 2, he's telling Israel, I, verse 19, I will betroth you unto me forever. And the terminology is very strong. It's, it's obviously not just I'm going to be like a husband to you. You know, he has already told them in Isaiah, your maker is your husband. He's already used the, the terminology of, I wrote you a bill of divorce. He's used that terminology of playing the harlot and committing adultery and all of that. And now he says that that adulterous wife that went away is going to be betrothed unto me in, in righteousness, in judgment, in loving kindness, and in mercies. I'll betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. <coughs> They're returning, Israel's returning, and this is why it ties into the new birth. The bride, the whole issue of the bride of Christ is an issue of returning to your first love. It's not a first time marriage. It's returning. It's a bill of it's a marriage that ends because of adultery, and a bill of divorce is written. And then there is a new marriage. Um, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter twenty-two. Israel's first love was the Lord, was Jehovah God. And Jehovah God, of course, Jehovah God of the Old Testament is the Christ of the New Testament. Matthew twenty-two and verse number forty-two. Matthew 22, verse 42. Um, uh, let's see, Matthew chapter, yeah. Saying, what, uh, what think ye of Christ, whose son is he? They said unto him, the son of David. Then saith he to them, how then doth David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? No man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. He is the Lord. He was that first love of the nation Israel. David in the spirit called him Lord. You know, who is this Christ? Well, he's the Lord from back there in the Old Testament. The Lord said to my Lord. The Father said to my Lord, to Christ, that Lord back in the Old... Christ was there in the Old Testament. Remember what he says, turn over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. What he says there in 1 Corinthians um, 11. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse uh, 4. And did all, this is when they're baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And verse 4, they did all eat of that same spiritual drink, or drink of that same spiritual drink, drank of that same rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. The rock that followed them, the rock that they drank from, the rock that they ate from there as they came out of Egypt was Christ. They're married to Jehovah in the Old Testament. They're, they're, who is Christ, they are his husband, they are his wife, rather, in the Old Testament. There's a bill of divorce written, and now there needs to be a return. There's going to be a return to him. And if you turn to the book of Revelation, and the book of Revelation is where the term actually comes from, the bride of Christ. Revelation 21, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So John sees the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, who is, who is that holy city? Well, if you notice verse... Um, uh, verse 10, you read something about the holy city. He carried me away in the, in the spirit in a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So the bride 
is the city. I saw the holy city come down prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now there, the term again is as. So she's prepared as a, as a bride to get ready for her husband. So New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. Prepared as a bride. But New Jerusalem, obviously verse 10, it is Jerusalem. In verse 12, it had a great it had a wall great and high and twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So the gates to get into the city are the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. So entry into the city is by being a part of one of those tribes. And we've talked about many times. You go down the hall to the restroom, it says ladies. What's that mean? That's where the ladies go. It says men, that's where the men go. So if you go to a city and it says, you know, this tribe, this tribe, this tribe, this tribe, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Benjamin, what's that mean? That's who goes through there. So the city is the dwelling place of those 12 tribes. Down in verse 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So the city's built on those 12 apostles of the Lamb, those circumcision apostles, those ones that Christ chose during his earthly ministry, that, that it, he said about Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church, that kingdom church. So everything about the city is Jewish in its nature. And the thing to me that really nails down what it is, so when you see the bride... The people that live in that city that's presented as the bride of Christ are clearly the nation Israel, the 12 tribes, built on the foundation of the 12 apostles. And then in verse 9, I think there's a real important verse here. There came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride. And then what's the next phrase? The lamb's wife. And, and what's the problem with that phrase? Right. So, show me the, I'll come show you the bride. We haven't had the, quote, marriage supper of the lamb here yet. So we have the bride coming down out of heaven. We have the city coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So she is a bride... But then the angel says, come on, and I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Well, now, if she's a bride, then she's not a wife. Because a wife, how, how long is a bride a bride? Until she's a wife. Until she says, I do, or he says, I do, or the preacher says, I do, or whoever says, I do. Then she's not a bride anymore. Now she's a wife. And so... When the verse says, you know, and for a long time, you know, I, I'd read through this and, and didn't really notice that. But to me, it's very important. I will show you the, the bride. And who is the bride? Well, the bride is the lamb's wife. That one that was the wife of Jehovah back in the Old Testament. That one that was written a bill of divorce. And now there's a separation and they're, they're divorced. And I am, I'm not your husband. You're not my wife because there's this divorce. But that one that was his wife is going to be born again. Remember we talked about the new birth. How that nation that, that spiritually died is going to receive new spiritual life. And that nation that receives new spiritual life and a new birth... Well, if it's a new birth and a new nation from that old ruins of that nation, then there's going to be a marriage. That new nation becomes a bride again. That nation that was the Lamb's wife, that went away and wrote a, got a bill of divorce, now receives a new birth and comes back to their first love and becomes his bride again. And there's a new marriage. The bride, the Lamb's wife, returns. Just like Hosea said, I will, I will betroth you unto me. Well, in the first part of the chapter, he said, you know, for adultery, I put you away. I wrote you a bill of divorce, but now I'm going to betroth you again. So the, the, bride, the bride is a bride, not because it's her first time of marriage, but because it's a new birth and a new marriage to that same husband that had put her away and written her a bill of divorce in the past. So the, the bride of Christ, the one that comes down, uh, 
this city and the people, the dwellers, the, the inhabitants, I should say, of that city, they are that bride. And they are the born-again nation that had been written a bill of divorce and been cast away and put aside, but now coming back to their first love and being reunited with him in the marriage supper of the Lamb. So it's, it's not all of God's people. It's not the church, the body of Christ, you know, he shall come to catch his waiting bride away. That's not it. It's that he's being reunited with this first love. He's being reunited with that one that went away from him. It's the bride who is the lamb's wife. That one that was put away, she's coming back to her first love. Because he has betrothed him unto her in righteousness and in judgment forever. This time... It's eternal. This time it's going to last forever because it's a new covenant based on better promises and better blood and all the things we've talked about before. So, you're not the bride. You're the body. But when you think about it, if God's purpose is to reconcile all things together in one in Christ, if we are joined to Christ as his body and Israel is joined to Christ as his bride, then... Where are all things reconciled together? In one in Christ. Because we are, we are united to him as his body. Israel's united to him as his bride. We rule in the heavens, Israel on the earth. And all is reconciled together in one in Christ. One, is, one as part of his body. One as part of his bride. His, which will become his wife. And they're reconciled together so that all things are gathered together in one in Christ. For all eternity. Questions, comments, discussion, anything about that? No? So you know you're not married to Christ now, right? Everybody, okay. All right, let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll be dismissed. Our God and Father, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and the opportunity this evening of looking to your word and studying it together. And as we've done so, we pray that the things said and done are brought honor and glory in the name of Christ and been edifying to the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. One announcement I forgot to make, we'll not be having Bible